Okay. Uh, well, welcome everybody, uh, all, all the viewers to Facebook. Uh, I'm Mitzi Soretto and I'm back here again for another Facebook Live event for the best new true crime stories, well-mannered crooks, rogues, and criminals. And I am joined by a very fine gentleman today, T. Fox Dunham. Hi, Fox. Hi, Mitzi. Um, are we using real names here? Because I got to tell you, I've been writing mafia stories and I've made some enemies. So I'm hiding out here in Pennsylvania and, you know, I'm keeping my appearance quiet here because, you know, you're right about people like Nicodemus Scarfo and uh, Lansky and all the other mafia guys. And they take note. They take notice. They, they, they say it's no problem. But, you know, I'm, I'm keeping myself under wraps. Well, unfortunately, you, you sort of gave the game away by saying what state you're located in. I, I, you, you should have you should have not done that. You should have like um, thrown the ball in a different direction. Say you're like reporting you're in, you're in we're streaming from Zimbabwe or something like that. Oh, did I say Pennsylvania? I meant Transylvania. You know. Oh, Transylvania. There you go. That's great. You know. <laughs> Well, you know, I've been watching, um, getting ready for this event. I went back and listened to a bunch of Nicodemus Scarfo documentaries, and they always interview the guys, you know, the rats who were in the witness protection program, and they show up in their hats and their sunglasses, and <laughs> you know, as if as if someone's going to leap through the camera and recognize them. So I thought I'd join in, and you know, yeah, well, the, the 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 fake beard and the must, you know, yeah. the Groucho Marx mustache, and <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, well, I don't know. I, you know, if they want to find you, they will. That's the problem. Yeah, probably will, unfortunately. And I live in I live in Lancaster, PA. I can say that now that I, you know, I don't think I'm being hunted down at the moment. But um, <laughs> we are we are actually in the number one refugee center for America. All the refugees come here, and it's not just refugees. I've gone in the supermarket. And I'll watch uh, these these gentlemen, um, and they'll take out rolls of cash. They'll have the hat on. They've got the accent. Oh, thanks, doll. I had to pick up some milk today. And you just, and I, I've read about this. There are a lot of witness protection program people here in like Delaware and Maryland. So I, I look around and I'm like, that's a wise guy. That's a wise guy. It's got to be. So. Oh, that's interesting. I thought Lancaster was pretty much uh, peaceful Amish communities and rolling hills. <laughs> oh, it, it is too. But I got to tell you, I, I know some Mennonites too, and they're wacky. I know some very <laughs> funny character Mennonites. Um, so interesting place. <laughs> Wait, another true, a true crime story about the Mennonites. <laughs> oh, there, there are some, there, there are rumors of a Mennonite Amish mafia who um, keeps the peace and keeps things under control. There was actually a show about that. Well, I'll look into it one day. Yeah, why not? Why not? Well, yeah, I mean, if, if, if I'm, I wouldn't surprise me. Let's put it that way. Uh, well, you've written a very interesting story for the book, uh, Little Nikki, The Tragedy mm -hmm. of the King of Atlantic City. Um, so what was it about our, our, our character here, Nicodermo Scarfo? What was it that, that made you want to write about him? He is the ultimate iconic mafia boss. And I say that we, we have a representation of the, the Italian uh, mafia gentlemen, the bosses, the soldiers, um, the guys who want to get made. We've seen many shows about it, many movies, or a lot of legends, a lot of folklore, mostly because of their style and the way they act. Of course, there are many other uh, organized crime groups based often on nationality because these were immigrant groups coming in in the late 1800s, the 1920s, fighting poverty to find some kind of place in American society. But Nicky represents, and he's just the ultimate quintessential iconic mafia boss. He rises up from nothing. He's, uh, I'll say this, I, I apologize for language. He's a smart ass. He shuns authority. He sticks his nose up at everybody, yet he makes his way up and he becomes boss, and then through his violence, his greed, and his vanity, he loses it all. And people ask me why I like mafia stories, why I like writing about them, because they're, 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 they're stories about modern kings, like reading Shakespeare. And I love, I'm, I'm a huge history buff. It's what I do when I'm not writing. I read and study history. And I read about the Plantagenets. I read about the Wars of the Roses or the Tudors or the Stuart Kings, you know, 
and you read about these great leaders who through vanity, greed, uh, have a downfall. And we don't really have kings like that anymore. Monarchy is definitely something that's that's outdated in the modern world. But in these small communities, and they're really little independent countries in America, these individual, these feudal states almost that have their kings and their lords and their, their aristocracy, we're seeing these stories of the rise and fall of kings, just like in a Shakespeare play. And Little Nicky was just the most iconic rise and fall story of kings that I, I've really found in all the mafia stories. I, I love that uh, analysis of, of the Shakespearean. I, I can see that. I mean, when I was when I was initially, you know, looking at your story and we were working together on it and I thought it, it didn't occur to me, but it is. It is it is our Shakespearean uh, uh, tragedies. And, and in, in little Nikki's case, it ultimately was a tragedy, but we won't give everything away. But yeah, I mean, it's he's definitely quite a character, and and um, the way you you um, portray him in your piece, it, he really does come to life. It's it's not at all a dry read. It's it's um, more like something you would read if, if it was a novel. And we kind of were bouncing yes. back and forth on that too during the editing process. But um, t tell us, okay, you gave us a bit of idea about little Nicky. So he basically he basically came from nothing. I mean, he was a, a, a from an immigrant family, poor immigrant family, and. Um, there was there were no no silver spoons in his mouth, right? No. Nineteen thirty, his family comes over, classic immigrant family coming from Italy, looking for a better life. They go to New York, and um, the depression hits. Now he had two uncles, the Piccolos, who were in the early Italian mafia at a time when they were um, moving away from um, prohibition and getting into organized labor. And of course, World War Two hit, and they had a lot. They made a lot of money at the docks and things like that. But um, his family was dirt poor, and they got poor, and they um, they moved to New Jersey for a little bit. And there's a story I like to tell about Nicodemus Scarpo, and it's probably really quintessential and iconic, and I put it in the story, was that he picked strawberries in New Jersey, right around Princeton, that area, and he would go every day in the beating hot sun in these almost desert-like conditions, and he would be there from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., hunched over picking these strawberries until his hands were stained red, which is good for him considering his future, just with his sweet syrupy strawberries, his back hunched over. And after a few weeks of this, he just decided, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to be some poor, dumb immigrant who's going to stay poor the rest of his life, being kept down because he saw the injustice. He saw the enforced poverty that drove many of these immigrant families into organized crime, which is not um, not a stereotype, however. There were many Italian families who uh, were good to each other, they worked hard, they went to church, and they built themselves up into a middle class in America. Um, but so he just decided he wasn't going to be one of these poor, dumb idiots. And he did well at school, he stayed in school, he boxed for a bit, and using family connections, he just worked himself up but yeah, he came from that poverty, which is so common. And more than that, the injustice that they suffered, the sort of class repression that they had. So yeah, so he just wasn't going to pick strawberries the rest of his life. And and obviously, I, I recall in the story, as far as actually making his boxing a viable mm -hmm. career, he was yeah. he was um, not called little Nicky for no reason, right? Right. He was he was too small to be a boxer. And after a few fights and I mean, it's where he sort of developed his viciousness. He realized that he wasn't going to win in a fist fight, in an equal fight. So the only thing he could do to compensate for that was just to have rage, to be really vicious. And that stayed with him the rest of his life. Yeah, I mean... Uh... We we get into this in the story quite a lot about the violence, and I mean, obviously, with with the mafia there is violence, but Little Nicky did seem quite violent. But um, before we get into the violence, what what actually qualifies him to be in a book of well mannered criminals? Well, he loved the life, he loved the style, and again, I think he was always afraid that um he was going to be seen as a poor immigrant or a nobody or, you know, somebody that, that came from the gutter. So 
he imitated his uncles. He imitated a lot of the guys around him who, he, you know, he had hand-tailored suits. He learned to be charming. He was very charming. Um, I would say well-spoken in the parlance that he knew. You know, like I wouldn't call him Alfred Lord Tennyson, but he definitely <laughs> knew how to be charming when he spoke. Very debonair, very upper class. I said with the suits and he gave a lot of money. He would take people out to dinner, you know, like, like almost like a Robin Hood and very much that, again, iconic image that made him into an arist aristocratic member of his community where, you know, his family members and kids were looking up and saying, I want to grow up and be little Nicky one day. Of course, they didn't call him little Nicky because he's probably <laughs> wacky for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he wasn't too shy about whacking people or asking yeah. others to do the whacking for him, no. right? No, he was not. Uh, we can get into that later if you like, but he, sure. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so, so he, he worked himself up from nothing. Uh, give us a bit of an overview of his career. I mean, uh, obviously, there were a lot of steps that he had to take in order to finally get to that top that he was aspiring to. But tell us a bit about that. Little Nicky uh, knew how to work hard. He had a good work ethic and he didn't shy away from, you know, he wasn't lazy, but the thing was, he also had a mouth on him. Like um, he, he, the consulary of the Philadelphia AC family wanted him to marry his daughter. And he said, no, I'm not marrying that dog. I'm not marrying that, you know, and it got him into trouble. It nearly got him whacked, but he went to his uncles as the Piccolo brothers and they, they, they stood up for him and got him a pass, as you say. But so he ended up in jail. Um, he stabbed a longshoreman because he wouldn't get out of his seat at the um, Oregon Diner in Philadelphia. He, um, you know, so he was in jail a couple of times. But and what happened was they finally said um, his uncles, they gave him a pass. He said, OK, uh, Angela Bruno said, who was head of the, the, um, the Gentle Don, who was head of the Philadelphia crime family, sent him to Atlantic City w early in his career. And that was pretty much a dead zone, pretty much a nowhere. He wasn't going to make any money there. At the time, Atlantic City had once been a lavish resort town, you know, that everybody went to in the late 1800s um, with wonderful resorts, the beach, you know, I, I love uh, New Jersey. I love I love the beach out there. So we try to get out there a couple of times a year. But Atlantic City is pretty much like it was then. It was run down in the 40s and 50s. People had started using transportation like airplanes and trains to go to Florida, to go out to Las Vegas, and Atlantic City uh, just kind of melted away and became a very poor town. So he was sent out there, and Nikki, little Nikki, had to struggle for every penny he made. I mean, there was still drunks out there to roll. There were still people he could give loans to, um, but he was working as a bartender. Um, he was just struggling for every dime. A lot of flim flam. I hear a lot of con that they did. Um, and he just struggled for years making, and, and Angelo Bruno and the rest of them figured, you know, he was gone out of sight, out of mind. Uh, he was in this dead area and it probably would have stayed that way until they brought in gambling in the 70s and little Nicky had a stranglehold on the people out there and on the businesses out there and a lot of people owed him money owed him favors he had set himself up as as a big king in a tiny little place and as soon as they brought in gambling his luck changed and that's when he built up a construction company scarpo inc because they were coming in and they were going to build casinos and he knew they were on a barrier island, so there needed to be concrete foundation. So he made sure he got the contracts to all most of the casinos. He got in with the bartenders and the construction companies and the various unions out there and just being at the right place at the right time. And if they had never brought in gambling to AC, so, uh, you know, you'd be going right now, who's Nicodemo? Who's Scarfy? You know, <laughs> just being at the right place at the right time. And he parlayed that into a fortune and just he had such power um, that he built up in the area and so much money was coming in so that when the uh, mafia war started you know when they killed angelo bruno they, they shot him in the back of the head and there's that horrible picture of him in the front seat with his mouth hanging open outside of his house and this 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 sort of tormented scream that would never stop 
And then, of course, they killed uh, the chicken man, Tessa. They blew up his porch with a nail bomb, trying to blame it on the carpenters union. And Nikki just waited. He didn't get himself involved in any of the, you know, the uh, the the uh, plotting that was being done without the commission's permission. And he just waited until he was the only one left standing. And boom, they put a crown in his head and elected him king. He, he was definitely quite a strategist. I mean, yes. as far I mean, in, in, in the story, you often have him saying like, he's just, he's just waiting. He's just biding mm -hmm. his time, you know, he, you know, because, because he also, he, he had a short fuse as well. Right. I mean, he, this is what got him in trouble early on. Yeah. He had quite the mouth and he had quite the short fuse and he, you know, we, we talk about in the story, they say that um, Tommy from Goodfellas, is based on Little Nicky, and I, I think that's a that's a generalization, but you can definitely see many, many qualities of the little guy, um, like as a boxer who had to fight, and rage, and just use that sort of, uh, I almost call it berserking, like the old berserker warriors who would build up the red rage and just go crazy and foam at the mouth, and that was the way he compensated for his lack of strength, and he had a high high squeaky voice that he was very embarrassed of, and. You know, the only way to get himself taken seriously was to have that rage and project it in, in those kind of situations. But yeah, for a long time, he, he couldn't shut his mouth and he couldn't keep himself under control and he just spit in your face. And I think that being in exile out in Atlantic City and, you know, because he lived in a boarding house uh, that was owned by his mom for years and lived with a family and he had a, a second wife out there. And I think he learned to sort of grow up and keep his mouth shut and and not impulsively act. And it's a shame that he forgot this because when he became boss, he just, his impulses took over. And he, um, the one thing that, that was very different about Angelo Bruno and Angelo Bruno ran the Philly mob for 20 years. They called him the gentle Don because his modus operandi was keep things quiet don't let the public know that you exist, make money quietly, and turn down a lot of the opportunities that would draw attention to the mafia, you know, in, in order to keep things as a status quo, even though that meant turning down a lot of business opportunities that were too public that could draw too much attention to the mafia. In fact, that's what got him killed in the end. And then Scarpo comes in, two bosses later, you know, they were, they were whacked. Uh, Testa and um, so Scarpo comes in and he's the exact opposite. He's a cowboy, and that's how he wanted things. Like you, you whack someone, you do it in broad daylight in front of everybody. You, you, you shoot them in the head in front of a crowd. He wanted everyone to see it, and he wanted everyone to know that it was Nicodemo Scarpo that that had whacked him or had him whacked through one of his associates. Um, there's a um, I, I, we were just in Wildwood uh, four weeks ago. I, we went down before my surgery, uh, like two days before, and we stayed overnight in Wildwood, New Jersey, which is a wonderful shore town, uh, very family resort, a lot of old motels that are designed like 1950s motels. And I always take Alice into the one hotel. I won't say which one it is, but I'll point out and I'll go, yep, yeah, Scarpo had someone's dad whacked right there on these steps in the middle in the middle of this family resort, which was a huge no-no if you were in the mafia, the commission didn't like it, but he made a lot of money. But so, yeah, so he was very impulsive growing up and it got him into a lot of trouble. It nearly got him whacked, like what he said about um, uh, Regan, I, I, Ru, Rubinetta's daughter, Rubinetta's daughter, I'm sorry, I have to find the name. I don't want to say it because I'll get it wrong. And then um, he was protected and then he went to AC, he calmed down, he learned how to control himself and then he became mob boss and he lost all that self-control and it was his downfall in the end. So he, he got what he fought so hard for and then he just regressed mm -hmm. right back to um, the, the things that were keeping him back in the first place. Exactly. And that's, and that's uh, when I went into the character and I know I pitched the story to you and I sent you a long essay about it. And then I started really looking at the character and I wanted to frame it like a Shakespearean tragedy. And I'm like, well, well, what's his Richard the Third tragedy? What's his, 
what's his downfall? What couldn't he correct about himself where the man could have been a wealthy and wise king who, who dies in his uh, bed surrounded by his grandchildren, or he can die in jail, which he did. He died of cancer. And I looked at him and I thought to myself, he, that was the thing. He couldn't control that impulse. He couldn't control that, uh, that rage and the paranoia that just took him over in the end where he didn't trust anyone. And he just started whacking his oldest friends. And that's what upset his own people where they're like, well, we used to have this bond. We used to be this family in AC. We were surviving. It was just us against the cops and the normal people and our own families and the mafia. And then when he got in power, he just stopped trusting everyone. If they got too powerful, if they got too much money, if they could be any kind of threat to him at all, he didn't care about the loyalty. He would just have them whacked. He would come up with some reason and have them whacked. And then everyone's like, no one's safe. Because you got to have, even in the mafia, you got to have rules. You got to have order. That's what they always say. You got to have order in this thing, in the Cosa Nostra. And you start upsetting that morale and you start killing people just because they're doing well or because they've got more money or because they've got a lot of loyalty, then no one can do well without becoming a threat. And eventually they turned on him because they were afraid they were going to be next. So little Nicky's lack of self-control and his own paranoia destroyed that bond of loyalty and trust with his own crew. And they turned on him. They turned witness. And he ended up in jail for nine murders uh, later on. And that's where he died. Would you say that um, then he's, he's not really as typical then? I mean, if there is such a thing as a typical mafia Don or whatever. But I mean, the fact that he did turn against everybody, he just he distrusted everybody. He was pretty paranoid. Would you say that's sort of a common thing? No, it wasn't. That's something that made him unique was that um, when you became boss, you became boss because you had the support and loyalty of the other made guys, the other captains. Um, you were trusted by the commission. Uh, uh, for, for your listeners who, are, who don't know, the uh, mafia has a board of directors that was formed back in the 20s called the commission. And it's made up of bosses from the biggest family. And they set policy. And you can't do things without permission. Like like, like I said, uh, rules, morale, or like the sort of morale. Um, they have their own bylaws. And it's set up much like a, a military uh, organization, paramilitary. And they base that on the old Roman legions with officers and um, commanders and you have to get the permission of your officer and then they had the commission who set policy and you couldn't whack a boss without getting the commission's permission uh things like that so so yes you had to have the loyalty of your people they had to be able to trust you if you whacked one of them if you killed one of them you pushed the button on one of them it had to be because they broke one of the rules you know, like they, they were stealing behind the boss's back or they were selling drugs, which was something they weren't supposed to do, but everyone did it anyway. And if you got caught, they'd whack you. Or if you um, became a serious threat or you screwed up and put yourself in a position where um, if you didn't talk to the feds, you'd get 20 years. Yeah, they could whack you, but, if it, but they could only do it if you broke one of those rules. So Nikki just started whacking people, whacking his own people because they could pose a threat one day. And so he was very uncommon in that regard. And it led to his downfall. And it was pretty much the cracks in the 1980s mafia that led to its diminishment as a major power in American society. Uh, that's that's really, yeah. I mean, I, I, in, in the story, I mean, you could just feel how, <laughs> how fascinated you are in getting this 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 man's life and his character over mm -hmm. to the reader um 
Now, you mentioned earlier about the drugs that, you know, it was sort of you're not supposed to do it, but it, it was being yeah. done. But oh, yeah. but I, I if I'm correct, if I, uh, wasn't a little Nicky, um, didn't he get really angry about uh, some of the drug business going on? He he was very particular about his image. I mean, he I, the whole thing in the story is, comes across his image. Everything was his image. If yeah. somebody did something that that uh, didn't reflect well, he would not be very happy about it. Right, um, exactly. And um, some of his bosses or some of his people were, were alcoholics. And one of his underbosses actually was an alcoholic. And he, um, he would go out and drink and do it publicly. And it wasn't no good. It was like, you tell him if he does this, he's going he's gonna to get this, you know, with the finger. Um, but yeah, no. Um, and again, with the drugs, like if you lost control publicly or you partied or you act unseemly, you know, you hurt that reputation. Yeah, he'd whack you. He he'd kill you, um, um, for that. It was just, and we, we were we were talking about drugs too, and that's that the thing what really brought down the mafia. And and I'll tell you the stages of the mafia going through this. It starts in the eighteen hundreds when it's the arm of a political organization, um, like like Tammany Hall or Mike McDonald out in Chicago, and he had the Irish mafia. And then they moved into prohibition where they generated the kind of income where they no longer needed to be attached to a politician. And then after prohibition, they moved into organized labor. That's how they made their money. And then after that, uh, the big heroin craze hit, you know, uh, the, um, the French connection, uh, Marseille suppliers who were bringing in um, heroin uh, from the Middle East, these, these old uh, French underground people who had fought during World War II together, then just got the drugs and started bringing drugs over. And the Italians in like New York and stuff, they would whack up the drugs and, and send it out. And the thing about drugs were, was that before, if you, if you got into trouble, like got arrested for burglary or for smuggling or for flim flam or loan sharking, which, or gambling, illegal gambling, that was the big thing that they did. That was how Nikki, uh, used a lot of illegal gambling and also then gambling and loan sharking and stuff to make money. But um, then they got into drugs and the bosses said, well, you know, you go away for gambling, you go away for two years. But if you get caught selling drugs, you can go away for 20 to 30 years. So when, when the guys would get caught, they would get into, a, you know, being faced with 20 or 30 years in prison, they would start talking. So all the bosses said, no one can sell drugs. And of course, then the bosses would go and sell heroin or sell drugs and then get into trouble themselves. But it was these long jail sentences and getting them to turn on each other, which pretty much ended the power of the modern the modern mafia. So Nicky Scarpo, I'm sure he, he did do some deals on the side, but like they didn't sell drugs. They did everything else. Like they would loan the money to a, to a drug dealer to buy a shipment of heroin or they would they would tax them. Uh, money, like you know, because that was that was something else. Scarpo did was that when he gained power, uh, Angelo Bruno had arrangements with other organized crime groups in Philadelphia in the area where they could sort of operate on their own and, and not be bothered, and they just sort of lived with each other. But when Scarpo took over, he wanted a cut of everything. He was king of Philadelphia. He was king of Atlantic City, and. He owed. He was owed everything. You sold, uh, you know, one one thing of drugs. You stole a stereo. You stole a car. Well, you better kick up your tax, your ten percent. And he sent his people out into Philly. And if you didn't pay up, they they'd kill you. They'd beat the crap out of you. They'd leave you on a street corner for everyone to see. So going back to what you're saying about um, his image, and we and I took a a, a round route getting here was that nobody could defy him publicly. And that's very important for a man in his position to uh, show no weakness, to show no vulnerability. Uh, there was a uh, Falco, uh, who was a construction guy in Atlantic City, and he was talking bad about Falco, or sorry, Scarpo Inc., the construction of the concrete company. And he, oh, they're, they're unprofessional they pour bad concrete the foundations are cracked and um you can imagine what, what scarfo eventually did to him you know, yeah because, he wouldn't have been too happy about that yeah because he was talking bad about nikki and if nikki 
let him get away with that, you know, then then it would show some weakness and other people would start not kicking up their tacks or taking advantage of him. So image was incredibly important to Nikki as it is to Kings, because you can't show a little bit of weakness because you've got enemies who want your power, who want your wealth. And if you show, if you put even a little bit of blood into the water, those sharks are going to come at you. So for Nikki, image was very much about survival. Uh, it's just an incredible character. We have someone commenting, um, inquiring, Flim Flam. Can you define Flim Flam? Flim Flam, um, con artistry. The Flim Flam people are the ones that con people. Um, there, was a, there was a bunch of deals going on uh, with, with Carmati the Crow uh, where they would, um, you know, take a guy into the bank and they were like trading out some money or um, they were like getting him to like ten thousand dollars, and then he'd just be standing there in the middle of this con, and they would uh, leave with him just standing there waiting for the money, and he had no idea who it was. Basically, they were conning uh, different con jobs. And the thing about the con is that your mark needs to be dishonest. They say a, they say an honest man can never be conned, and it's it's pretty much true uh, because you know if you're in on the con and you're in on this deal that you think's going down um you're pretty much engaging in a criminal enterprise and if you get conned you can't go to the cops and say well we were trying to sell these coins that were undervalued and we were faking out the bank manager because you'll get arrested too so flim flam uh con jobs competence tricksters Con, okay, yeah, confidence tricks was just popping up. Says con, con jobs, really. I mean, yeah, you just basic, basically this different names for the same thing. Flim Flam's got this wonderful sort of yes. um, uh, 40s feel to it, mm -hmm. 1940s feel. Right, bunker, the bunker. <laughs> oh, um, as, as far as um, true crime goes, if, mm -hmm. so was, was uh, have you have you done anything in true crime before or you're, oh, yeah. when you actually set out to write this you weren't actually planning to do sort of a true crime story right it was really my first non-fiction um going back to true crime like okay when i say yes i have i'll take the stories of, of mafia guys or um drug dealers and then map them onto my characters and twist it into fiction uh, but actually, come to think of it, this was my first real nonfiction in true crime. So yeah, so this was this was my first first run with it, and that's what made this so intriguing. Was that when I, you know, when I create a character, I start from the theme up. You know, what what creates their soul? What defines them? What conflict drives them? What fear are they running from their whole lives? What are they scared of? What's at stake? But for little Nikki. It was an exploration. I had to dig into his character. I had to find everything written about the guy. I had to read about people in his situation. So it was a lot of fun because instead of creating, I got to explore. I got to uncover my own kind of mystery. And I was talking about how much I love history. And that's pretty much what I read all night and day when I'm not, when I'm not writing fiction. And I love understanding what makes people people. So... You have to answer your question. This was, I think, my first true crime story. Well, I hope it won't be your last. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about expanding the story into something a little more. Um, you know, maybe maybe doing a novel or something, but that's going to require more research. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's what makes the you know that's the fun part about these anthologies is mm -hmm. having all these different writers approaching their subjects in a different way. So you're just you're just getting so many different ways of writing and telling a story and viewpoints. And and in this particular story, um, it all it almost reads like it is a novel, but but it isn't fiction. It's it's real fact that's in here. I mean, obviously you've invented some dialogue, but that's mm -hmm. pretty yeah. much what every true crime writer. Does. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because um, the actual story, I had to cut so much material out to hit the word count. And um, and there were some scenes that uh, were duplicated or just too violent, or I decided to uh, make the point of that scene into another scene and kind of condense it down. And we went through the editing process, and you and I, and 
just, I was just very happy you were patient with me and <laughs> happy that you believed in what I was doing. And just, I'll never forget walking down uh, last summer around this time and Allison and I were walking down uh, Duke Street in Lancaster heading, I forget where we were heading, probably Central Market. And I had sent back uh, the, the initial idea for the story. Um, I had sent you what I'd kind of done to that point. And I was writing it much like some of the gritty true or the gritty crime stories that I had done and were expected in certain certain markets. And I just figured I'll write it exactly as it happened. And it was too violent for you. You said, well, I can't really, <laughs> I can't really publish this. And, and I'll forget the, the line you wrote. And I, I had it on that post-it note on the computer. And you <laughs> yeah. said, two, two good fellas. It's two good fellas. <laughs> and which was just, it's, it's two good fellas? What? What am I? Am I a clown? Do I amuse you? How am I funny? You know, going back into Henry and, and Tommy. Friend Bill will love that. And, um, you know, it's two good fellas. But, um, but I'll never forget that. And I read that and I'm like, and so we wrote back and forth to each other. And then the fly, you ended that last email with this phrase, which was very nice, I'm sure, but scared the hell out of me. It was good luck. <laughs> I'd say that to everybody. Don't worry. I always yes. say good luck with the writing. I don't... <laughs> kind of, it, it almost read like, um, well, this is horrible and it's violent and I can't publish this and I don't know how you're going to change it. So good luck. <laughs> It all came out well in the end, though. That's what it matters. Did. It did. Well, you um. Well, I, I remember walking with Allison, and she looked at my face. She's like, "What's wrong?" I'm like, "Mitzi <laughs> just wrote good luck." <laughs> I'm like, "I'm dead." <laughs> yeah, but, who's at the door? The doorbell's ringing. There's somebody outside in a drench coat. Watch uh -huh, out! Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Saw off shotgun under the thing. <laughs> And that's when it hit me what you wanted. I know, I know that you sort of um, not not like the term I use, but I realized that you wanted something a little more toned down, a little more palatable for the general reader who's not big in the mafia movies. Because I realized the tone of the other stories you were bringing in, and I'm like, I want, you know what? She wants once upon a time. Once upon a time, there was a there was a, an Italian immigrant who was very tough and didn't want to work in the strawberry fields. And I'm like, okay, I think I get it. I think I get it now. And you wouldn't believe. I'll have to send there was a you. lot of bloodshed in your story. I don't think there it was, was once upon a time. <laughs> there was, but I mean, compared to what was in the story and just his violence and his language and the rage that he did um, and just the brutality of the man, believe me, we toned it down quite a bit. <laughs> I had a, I, I did the same thing with uh, with Joe Turner in the Small Towns book about the um, mm. the uh, the cannibal uh, guy. <laughs> like Joe, right. Joe, you need to sort of like you know <laughs> adjust that a bit. Right. I mean, some right. some things are just so horrible, but I mean, you do have to make it somewhat palatable, and you know, and especially with true crime, because there's always that connotation that maybe there's a bit too much sensationalism, and I certainly yeah. don't want to go down that road. And I think that's why these books are people like them is because they're not sensationalizing a crime or a criminal or victimizing the victims even further. That's what was so wonderful about what you did was that you took uh, the extremity off the story. You took the focus off the violence, his language, his good fellas, Tommy like behavior. And when we took that off and focused more on what made him work and how he interacted and his survival and his underdog, the underdog spirit. We were allowed to focus more on what made him tick as a person, what drove him, what his weaknesses were. And I got to thank you for that because I've never really looked at a story like that before. So, I mean, every editor has a vision of what they want and that vision often grows as they read the stories that are coming to them. Like when I, uh, did the anthology that I did for Gutter Books uh, based on the Pink Floyd anthologies. It was, it was crime stories based on songs of Pink Floyd. And I got about 70 or 80 stories in, which was, that was quite a, quite a six months reading all those. My first time <laughs> editing at all. 
And I realized what you were trying to do with your book is that you had a certain vision, you had a way you wanted your readers to feel when you were reading it. And that's something that has made me successful over the last decade of writing since I, since I started sending out stories back when, oh, back when we didn't have email, back when it was a printed story in a manila envelope with a cover letter. <laughs> In the post office. The essay, the essay SD that you had to include in every, <laughs> you know, back then before everything went email, thank God that it did because, yes. you know, you could maybe get out one story a day or two and then it took six, you know, six months to hear back. Um, but And yeah, you have so, to mortgage the house to pay for all the postal costs. <laughs> oh, God, I remember just, yeah, but, but I, you know, all these years, something that's made me pretty successful is that I can, I, I hear a lot of authors who are very possessive about their work and they refuse to give any credit to anybody. It's like, oh, they want to edit my story, but I need to preserve my vision. And it's like, it doesn't work that way. The moment you finish writing it and send it off to somebody, they're taking ownership of your story. It's like how we'll watch Doctor Who and fans get really personal about Doctor Who. And <laughs> if you change the story in a certain way, they'll feel offended. Um, you're sharing the story. It's not just yours anymore. It's the editors, it's the other readers. And you have to be able to make modifications to share your vision and change it and sort of come together for this, this group thing so, like I said, I've been very successful because I've been able to uh, connect to editors and realize their vision and shape it that way. But your vision really helped me bring out a side of that uh, that I that I wouldn't have found trying to write it with that violence and the good fellas and the casino, uh, you know, head in the vice with the eye popping out stuff. And instead, we 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 got away from all that and got to the source of his spirit, and that was all you. And you taught me something. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, um, you know, it's I, I don't like to really tell people to, you know, I like to it's it's their story, it's their vision, it's it's their baby, so to speak. Um, so you know, I I do I do what I can, you know. Obviously, if if people feel strongly they don't want to take my advice, they certainly don't have to. I mean, I've heard plenty of horror stories of, of authors who have had editors that essentially try to destroy their work and there are yeah. editors out there who are just not very good editors or they just have some idea in their head that they i don't know maybe they're frustrated writers you see i'm i'm, I'm an author you know i'm a writer so I, uh -huh. I understand both sides of the coin but perhaps some don't because all they do is take other people's work and maybe want to change it to something that they feel like changing it to and i i don't want to do that and i hope i haven't done it to anybody Oh, I don't think so. You're a wonderful editor. And oh. this, is, this was one of the best stories I've done. And I didn't pay you any money. I didn't send you any extra checks to say, say all these great things about me on Facebook Live. This is all coming from you. <laughs> I well, just paid you for your fee and that's it. You know? Well, you're devoted to what you do and you're professional. And I love seeing you produce new books. And I, I've worked with many editors, but you're definitely top of the list. Oh my goodness, gee. Well, if there's an editor's award of the year, put me up for it. <laughs> I will. I shall. Maybe. I don't know if such a thing exists, but I mean, we, we should invent one then. Okay, we'll invent one. All we'll right. invent Good. one. We'll invent we'll call, one. We'll call it the Mitzies. Oh, the Mitzies. There's only one person nominated. <laughs> me. Well, there you go. <laughs> Why not? Oh, um, just to backtrack a minute, because this was such a cool thing in your story. We were talking about the drugs and everything. Um, was it was it the Mayan motorcycle gang that um, was it oh. them? The notorious Mayans. Yeah. Tell us about yeah. that. OK, um, again, Nicky Scarpo went to war uh, with everyone uh, because he wanted to be king of Philadelphia. And again, it was very much going back to my, my love of the Plantagenets, who were very much the medieval kings. I mean, you, you look back to the monarchy in, say, Great Britain and Europe, uh, to the Bourbons, uh, to, uh, you know, the various emperors of Germany and the Holy Roman Empire. And there are different phases that define uh, their, their, you know, the various kinds of kings. The Plantagenets were very much at a time when there was constant war and everything was land. And then you have, um, and then England sort of 
grows into this uh, center of commerce. And then after, of course, the English Civil War, Oliver Cromwell, they bring back in the Stuarts and they become the kings who represent commerce and wealth. They're no longer the, Plata the Plantagenet kings of war uh, that, that, you know, going back when uh, they were constantly fighting in Europe for different territories that used to belong to their family, going back to William of Conqueror. So little Nicky was very much a Plantagenet type king. He took over oh, the royal family. He took over his territory after Angelo Bruno and the other uh, mafia leaders had sort of divided things up and let other countries and other little states rule in Philadelphia and have their own territory. But little Nicky wanted to be emperor. He wanted it all. He wanted Philly. He wanted Atlantic City. He wanted to control it all. And of, of course, the motorcycle gangs were just one of the many different organized crime groups and they dealt with drugs and heroin uh, you know uh, especially in the early 80s and late 70s and they wouldn't come to heal they wouldn't kick up attacks so yeah so he sent out teams you know these almost paramilitary commando squads and they would go and shoot up their bars they would blow up their bikes and just this war on this motorcycle club and uh we don't know for sure, but they're saying they killed hundreds and hundreds of these people. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I mean, the Mayans are pretty notorious as, as a hardcore gang, too. <laughs> right. To take them on is no easy feat, I think. Right, exactly. And again, the, going back to the Plantagenet Kings, this was basically his warfare. This was um, his going into France. And, you know, like like uh, Henry II or Henry V or Richard the Lionheart going out to the Crusades, he fought these wars like a Plantagenet king. And he fought the other kings and other lords for this territory. And he won by just being more vicious, by killing more and doing it publicly. And eventually he did become king of Philadelphia, king of Atlantic City. And everybody was kicking up to him. Uh, you even mentioned in the story that uh, uh, Donald Trump had to kick up to him yep. too. <laughs> yep, which was no. You know, I'd love to. I'd love to put. Um, yeah, it was no crime. It was the cost of doing business. If you operated a casino in Atlantic City, and not just building the casinos, but little little Nicky controlled the union. That, that dealt with the dealers and the waitresses and the um, people parking the cars and doing the shows. And if you didn't do what he wanted, I mean, he even worked with one of the mayors. He got him elected. And so everything was funneled through Nikki. And if Trump wanted to build his casino out there and wanted it to function, yeah, he had to kick up too. They all did. It's what you did in Atlantic City. If you didn't, uh, the, uh, you, the workers' union would stop building your casino or the dealers wouldn't come in you know they'd call a strike and then you just end up writing a check for ten thousand dollars and it was like paying your electric bill or for your concrete amazing amazing i i don't think a lot of people are probably that aware of of how atlantic city uh got its second wind because i mean it was a basically a dead it was. wasteland and then um you know suddenly atlantic city is back and all this stuff's going on and continues but um it, little nikki certainly played a major role in that clearly right exactly it was 1976 and um the governor he was uh not the governor i'm sorry the uh the mayor was it yeah, I think I got to I got to check my notes. To, I had all these notes written out of too many notes. I think it was the mayor. Yeah, but he was on television and he said um, he basically looked at the camera and said to the mafia, keep your hands off Atlantic City as if they were going to come in and just take over as soon as gambling was brought in. And little Nicky laughed. He was sitting with his nephew, Phil Leonetti, crazy Phil. And he said, what? What's he talking about? We're already here. We've always <laughs> been here, you know. <laughs> well, they were there. They were always there, probably just a bit quieter until little Nicky showed up on the scene. Right, right. <laughs> Waving his banners. 
Oh my goodness. Well, it's it's a fascinating story, uh, Little Nikki, the tragedy of the king of Atlantic City. Um, and just to ask in, in as we wrap up, um, what other projects are you involved in? Uh, you have a very successful podcast, if I'm right. What are you afraid of? Horror and Paranormal Show um, had 165 episodes. It's been on pause for a little bit. I got um, <laughs> uh, I got very sick this summer, uh, an infection in my liver and pancreas, and it was caused by they're not sure what it was, but I'm a I'm a cancer survivor, so my immune system I had lymphoma, so my immune system's pretty poor, and so I ended up in the hospital for a while. In fact, it was actually touch and go. And then they had to do surgery a few weeks later. And so I had to put the show on pause, at least for a while. But no, it was we've done about 165 episodes. I've interviewed ghost hunters from around the world and people on Discovery Channel. And, you know, uh, various horror authors have come on. You know, we, we've talked to everybody, lots of ghost stories and things like that. And so that's sort of on pause. And I'm looking to expand that into other other things. And I just finished um, my first Sherlock Holmes story, which was a lot of fun. So that was my big thing this summer, you know, just always wanted to do a Holmes story. And I saw a, um, a market looking for, they wanted stories about the villains of Sherlock Holmes. Not so much Sherlock Holmes himself, but the various- the Moriarty's. Movies. Yeah, <laughs> right, the Moriarty's, except of course Moriarty was the most popular. And yeah. so I had to pitch a story like the way I pitched it to you. And I, I had to pick a villain. I decided to go with Abe Slaney, who is in the Mystery of the Dancing Men, which is a story about these codes that show up written on uh, this English gentleman's estate. And I picked the character because he was um, a member of the Irish gangs out of Chicago, come to England looking for his runaway fiance. And I thought I could really tie that into the work that I've done with true crime and crime fiction. So, so trying to get that story d done ended up being quite the battle with all the medical stuff going on. Yeah. And of course, it's also historic fiction, uh, you know, being writing in England. And I, I said in 1923 and learning about uh, the history of the, the Irish crime families out in Chicago. So um, I, finished, I finished that up. And of course, there's always stories in the works, always editors who come to me and, and say, you know, we're putting together this anthology. Could you do a story for me? So that's pretty much been my summer. And I'm looking, I'm open to new projects uh, in the next couple of months. So if you hear anything, let me know. Well, if you, you know, my calls are always up as well. If anything yeah. shows up that might work for you. Um, about your podcast too, I think that's where, um, Yes, I'm, Paul. I, you know, I'm not sure Paul Williams, uh, if yes. you found me through Paul or he found me through you. I can't remember now. Paul, um, he loves Jack the Ripper. That yes, is, he certainly does. <laughs> that's one of his things. And so I thought it would make a good subject for an episode, you know, who was Jack the Ripper, I've always. And so one of the things I did about the show was that I would find very intelligent people who had built eruditions in areas that they loved. And Paul definitely has built an erudition. So I thought, you know, bring him on the show. We'll talk about Jack the Ripper. And I used it to promote the story he had done for your previous anthology. And that's when I checked the book out. I love the style. I love the quality. And I thought, you know what, I need to do something for this. And then I saw that you were taking in stories for well-mannered. And I thought, what better story that I could tell would be Nikki Scarpo. So. Yeah, well, Paul's in the well-mannered book as well. He is. He is. Indeed. Yeah, so it's the small towns book, and then uh, I think it was small towns. You know, it's I'm, I'm I've got so many on the go that I'm 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 almost like sometimes stumped about who's in what book and what stories in what book. It's right. like I'm talking about this today on Monday. I have to talk about another book, and it's like, well, <laughs> got to keep it straight. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Well, listen, I'm so glad you were able to come on and, and tell us about little Nikki, who is uh, a very iconic uh, mobster, uh, mm -hmm. a incredible story, a Shakespearean story indeed. Um, and again, the story is Little Nikki, the Tragedy of the King of Atlantic City. And I've been speaking with T. Fox Dunham from The Best New True Crime Stories, Well-Mannered Crooks, Rogues, and Criminals. Thanks so much for coming on.
Thank you, Mitzi. It's been a pleasure. Hang on. I see your friend. <laughs> Malcolm's here. Finally, we meet. Teddy. Yes, you finally meet. <laughs> he was sitting here. He's just been sitting here wondering when he's going to get to come on. So he finally got on the True Crime Facebook Live. Well, it, it's very, it, they'll have to meet, hang out, bond sometime, complain about yeah, it. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe after COVID is over, we can actually see people. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> Thanks again. I appreciate your being on. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Mitzi. Bye.